The following are episodes 10 and 11 of my new podcast, Camping Horrors, which focuses on scary camping and hiking stories with the sounds of nature instead of music. Sit back, close your eyes, and scare yourself to sleep. But before you do, please follow and rate Camping Horrors on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app to help us reach more people. Thank you. A hike through the woods to clear your mind can turn far too quickly into a nightmare your mind and soul will never heal from. Today's two stories are examples of just that. Welcome to Camping Horrors, the show where real people send me their scariest camping and hiking stories, and I narrate them. The following tales feature a hunting excursion gone terribly wrong and childhood trauma from which the cinder will never escape. Enjoy. I would love to narrate your scariest camping and hiking stories, so be sure to send them to me at darkstories.org. And be sure to catch my other shows for more of my narrations at eeriecast.com. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. Follower from R. Hunter. It was a few years back when I found myself reeling from a painful breakup that had completely blindsided me. My now ex, Sarah, and I had been together for over five years, when out of the blue, she said she needed space. Before I knew it, she had moved out and cut off contact. I was devastated. We talked about spending our lives together, but now my future was unrecognizable. I wandered through each day feeling numb and lost in my own home. Everything reminded me of her. I needed to get away and clear my head. With deer hunting season coming up, I decided some time alone out in the familiar woods of my family's sprawling rural property would be good for me. Ever since I was a young boy, deer hunting in these woods during the fall had been a beloved tradition passed down from my father and grandfather. I headed out alone early one brisk November morning, just as the sun began to peak over the mountains nearby. A heavy silence hung over the forest as I hiked through the stands of evergreens. It was opening day of rifle season, but I wasn't concerned about bagging anything. I just wanted some space to gather my troubled thoughts after about an hour of hiking, I arrived at a clearing on a ridge which offered an incredible view of surrounding snow-capped peaks. This had been my grandfather's favorite spot. I sat against a tree, listening to the sounds of nature around me. For the first time in a long while, I felt the tension in my shoulders relax. Out of nowhere, a small herd of deer bounded through the clearing down the ridge, fleeing some unseen threat. I glanced up in time to see a beautiful buck emerge from the tree line, his impressive antlers crowning his head. My hunting instincts kicked in. I slowly raised my rifle, took aim, and felled the buck with one perfect shot. I took a moment to take in the kill, both proud and thankful for it. Then I began to field dress it. Skinning and cleaning the deer brought back fond memories of doing this same work as a young boy alongside my father and grandfather after successful hunts. They had taught me how to do it properly so as not to waste any part of the animal. I could almost hear their voices and laughter on the breeze. The sun was starting to set then by the time I was finished. I slung my rifle over my shoulder and gripped the deer's antlers. I started the arduous process of dragging the deer back to my truck. I'd parked a few miles away at the edge of the property earlier that morning. The weight of the large animal made for slow going over the uneven rocky ground. My breathing grew labored before long and my muscles burned from the exertion. As I stepped gingerly over fallen logs and branches, I was glad I'd worn my sturdy hunting boots. I frequently paused to rest and take swigs of water from my canteen. During one such break, I checked my watch and was surprised to see a couple hours had already passed. 
The sun had dropped below the ridgeline, bathing the sky in hazy pinks and oranges. Though I still had quite a bit of distance to cover, there was enough light left to make it back safely. With renewed vigor, I wrapped the deer's antlers once more in my gloved hands and continued my march. As I trudged along dragging the deer behind me, I heard the snap of a branch somewhere off in the trees. I spun around, my senses on high alert. Scanning the woods, I found nothing but deepening shadows stretching between the trunks. Uneasy, I shook my head and kept on walking. Probably just a squirrel or a bird, I told myself. I shook off the uneasy feeling from the snapping branch and continued dragging the deer through the darkening forest. Before long, I heard more odd noises from the dense trees around me. Twigs cracking, leaves rustling. It sounded like something was walking on two feet, keeping pace with me. My pulse quickened, but I told myself to remain calm. It was probably just a curious black bear. We'd had a few sightings on the property over the years. Even so, I picked up my pace, eager to get back to my truck. The noises continued, moving stealthily between the trees. Too quiet for a bear, I thought anxiously. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a fleeting shadow shift behind a large pine. I whipped my head around, but caught only a blur of darkness disappearing into the brush. The deer carcass seemed to gain weight with every step, as actual fear began to take hold. I wanted desperately to run, but I could hardly manage a hobbling walk weighted down by this deer. Whatever was stalking me stayed maddeningly out of sight, using the forest as cover. My heart pounded as the snapping branches and rustling leaves followed my every move. The presence felt ominous, even evil. I could not shake the feeling that intelligent eyes were watching me struggle from the shadows. I thought of my rifle then, slung uselessly over my shoulder. I needed both hands to drag this deer, which left me defenseless if this unseen thing decided to attack. With no other option, I summoned my last reserves of strength and forged ahead determined to make it back to the truck before nightfall. Just a little farther, I told myself, trying to ignore the creepy sounds paralleling me step for step. You might be wondering why I didn't just drop the deer and confront my follower or just walk away from it. Fear is a funny thing. At the time, I felt both terrified, but also silly for being scared because, again, I had no idea what it was. What if it really was nothing dangerous? Plus, I would have been mad at myself for having killed this animal just to leave it behind. My grandfather had always taught me to use as much of what I killed as possible. My blood turned to ice when a chillingly accurate deer call emanated from the trees behind me. The sound was a mocking impersonation of an alarm call from a white-tailed deer. No natural creature could mimic that so precisely. Adrenaline flooded my veins as the implication sunk in. This was no ordinary animal stalking me. Something intelligent, something utterly inhuman, was preying on me in the growing darkness. My guts twisted with primordial fear. The unseen creature grew more brazen, aggressively breaking branches as if to purposefully let me know it could end the game any time it chose. I was being threatened. I was being toyed with. Nearly delirious from exhaustion, I channeled every last ounce of strength into dragging that deer at a frantic pace. My lungs screamed for air and my legs wobbled, but I was wholly focused on reaching the safety of my truck ahead. With the last drags of daylight fading behind the trees, I finally stumbled into the small clearing where the old pickup was parked. I hurriedly loaded the heavy deer carcass into the truck bed as darkness enveloped the forest. I jumped into the driver's seat, 
my hands shaking violently as I fumbled to insert the key into the ignition. The woods behind me had gone deathly silent, but I could feel the presence of the predator, watching, waiting. As the engine roared to life, I said a grateful prayer that I would make it home alive. As I pulled away, a horrific otherworldly scream pierced the night air from somewhere deep in the black forest behind me. The ghastly sound sent shockwaves of dread down my spine. Whatever this malevolent entity was, it was furious that I had escaped its vile clutches. I drove recklessly fast down the winding dirt road, away from that godforsaken place, one trembling hand on the wheel and the other gripping tight around my rifle. When I arrived home, I leapt from the truck and raced to unload the animal. As I heaved its body from the truck bed, my blood turned to ice. The head was completely gone, ripped clean off the neck by some tremendous force. In the days that followed, paranoia consumed me. The image of the mutilated deer carcass seemed seared into my mind's eye. I constantly felt watched from the tree line at the edge of our property. At night, I would jolt awake certain the thing was outside, peering through my windows. Dark circles formed under my eyes that no amount of sleep could cure. One morning, our dog failed to greet me at the door as usual. I found the poor girl whimpering under the porch, viciously mauled but somehow still clinging to life. It felt like it was a message. This sinister presence could easily strike those I loved, if it so desired. One dreary morning, I worked up the courage to visit my grandfather. The old man had retired to a small place at the edge of town, not far from our family's property. I hadn't seen him in a while, and I felt guilty that it took something so dire to prompt a visit. When I arrived, Grandpa looked pleasantly surprised to see me. He invited me in, and we caught up over coffee at his worn kitchen table. Eventually, I broached the subject. I asked as casually as possible if he'd ever experienced anything odd while hunting near that ridge. Grandfather's expression darkened. He stared silently into his coffee mug for several long moments before speaking. You saw something out there, didn't you? He asked gravely. I nodded, ashamed to have brought up something that clearly troubled him. But I had to know. He leaned back with a heavy sigh. <sighs> Didn't want to believe it myself, he began slowly. But over the years, things happened that I couldn't explain. Strange calls in the night, an odd sense of being watched by an unseen menace. A couple of times, while hauling a kill, I'd hear twigs snapping, leaves rustling right behind me. My blood ran cold. It was just as I'd experienced. Never actually saw anything, though, Grandfather continued. And I didn't want to believe evil could exist so close to home, so I convinced myself it was all my imagination. But deep down, I've always known there's something darned unnatural in those woods. I told him every chilling detail of my encounter with the unseen stalker. The sound of branches cracking, the precise mimicry of deer calls, the mutilated carcass, he listened grimly, nodding in recognition. I'm sorry. I should have warned you, Grandpa said regretfully when I finished. All these years I've been denying it myself, pretending it was nothing. But it's still out there, I see. I changed the subject, trying not to linger on something so distressing. After all, my Grandpa's best years were behind him, and I didn't want to stress him out. It's been years now, though I'm still afraid it may be out there, lurking in the shadows. Maybe, hopefully, I'm just paranoid. Why I Can Never Go Hiking Again From Georgie 
There is one memory from my teenage years that still haunts me to this day. An encounter I had while hiking in the woods by my childhood home. It was something I witnessed that I can never unsee, and it changed the way I see the world, making me wary of the darkness that can lurk unseen even in the tranquility of nature. When I was 14 years old, hiking in the forested hills near my subdivision was one of my favorite after-school activities. I'd throw my backpack on and escape into those woods almost daily, wandering for hours amongst the oaks, pines, and maples until it started getting dark. It was so peaceful. Just me, the sounds of birds, and wind in the leaves. Usually, I'd bring a book or my Game Boy and I'd find a nice spot to relax, unwinding from the school day. It became my much-needed refuge. The wooded area stretched on for acres, with a few dirt trails crisscrossing through it. But I would often veer off trail, forging my own path through the trees and underbrush. I would encounter deer, rabbits, squirrels, your typical woodland creatures. Nothing threatening. Over time, I got to know the forest intimately, like it was an extension of my backyard. But all that changed one Saturday morning when I decided to go hiking before lunch. It was a mild, sunny day in early fall, leaves just starting to change color. Walking down the trail into the woods, I smelled that earthy forest scent, that one of soil and pine needles. Birds were chirping and flitted from branch to branch. It seemed like any other day. I followed the main trail for a bit, until it forked off. I took the path to the right, which wound uphill into a more dense part of the forest. The trees here were ancient, their thick trunks covered in green moss. I ambled along admiring the towering pines, when suddenly I noticed light streaming into a clearing up ahead. As I approached, I could see a man through the trees. He was furiously kicking dirt over a spot on the ground. He hadn't noticed me yet. I quickly ducked behind a large oak to observe what he was doing. Peering around the trunk, I tried to make sense of the bizarre scene. Why was he burying something out here? My first thought was that he had killed some kind of animal and was covering it up. But as I stared more closely, I caught a glimpse of what looked to be human hair mingled in with the dirt. My blood turned cold. Was he burying a person? I must have gasped out loud because the man suddenly stopped his frantic shoveling and stood upright. Who's there? Who's there? He barked, eyes scanning the tree line. I shrank back behind the oak, praying he had not seen me. My heart hammered against my ribs. The man called out again, his tone edged with anger. Come out! Come out. I heard you, I heard you, you little punk. Little punk. He began slowly walking towards my hiding spot, leaves crunching under his boots. I had to think fast. I debated revealing myself, acting casual and saying I was just passing by. But something about the malicious glint in his eyes told me that would be a deadly mistake. This was no ordinary hike anymore. I'd witnessed something sinister, possibly a murder. Fear gripped me rooting me in place. I wanted to run, but my legs were jelly. I heard the man drawing closer, his footsteps punctuated by the swish of a shovel cutting through the air. Any second now, he would circle the oak and find me cowering there like a scared rabbit. Fight or flight kicked in. I had to flee. Mustering all my courage, I bolted from the hiding spot and tore through the woods in the direction I came. The man let out an angry yell, and I heard him give pursuit. Twigs lashed my arms and face as I raced downhill, my vision blurred by adrenaline and tears. Daring to glance back, I saw the man gaining on me, his shovel raised high like a weapon. He bashed it against trees as he ran, slicing bark that exploded in his wake. He was maybe ten yards behind me, blinded by psychotic rage. I screamed and pushed my adolescent legs faster. 
I'd never run so hard in my life. My lungs burned as I sprinted through the shadowy forest. I didn't dare look back again. I could hear that maniac crashing through the underbrush behind me, cursing and swinging that shovel violently. He seemed so determined to catch me, as if he had to ensure I would never reveal what I'd witnessed. I couldn't let that happen. Dodging around trees, vaulting over rocks and fallen logs, I flew down the trail on wings of pure terror. I tried to recall the quickest route back to the subdivision from here. Left at the big oak ahead, a sharp right at the creek, just stay on the main path afterwards. My mind raced faster than my pumping legs. Then a terrifying idea hit me. How had I not thought of it sooner? Was he going to follow me all the way home? And if he did, would he murder my whole family to cover his tracks? Bile rose in my throat as I imagined my little sister or parents being slaughtered by this psycho. I had to lead him away from my house no matter what. Glancing left, I spotted a deer path veering steeply uphill. If I took that detour, it might disorient him long enough for me to get home safely. I banked sharply and scrambled up the incline, my shoes slipping on leaf litter. Behind me, the man wheezed and sputtered, struggling to keep up now. I'd gained some precious distance. As the hill leveled off, I risked a peek back. The man was kneeling now, bracing his hands on his thighs to catch his breath, but his eyes still burned with frightening intensity. He started to climb again, waving that shovel menacingly. You're dead, kid, he bellowed. No one's gonna believe a little turd like you. I faced forward, focusing everything on getting as far away from that madman as possible. My neighbor's houses came into view down the hill. Safety was so close, but the sound of the man crashing through the brush propelled me faster. Just as I sensed him nearing arms reach behind me, I heard a sickening crack, followed by a strangled cry. Oh! Oh! He must have struck something hard. I couldn't stop to look. I cleared the tree line and raced for home, rasping and wheezing. I'd escaped that monster's clutches by the skin of my teeth, but I wasn't safe yet. I burst from the tree line and sprinted across our backyard, my heart feeling like it was going to explode. I didn't stop until I was inside with the door locked behind me. My mom jumped up from the couch, startled by my dramatic entrance. Honey, what happened? She asked eyes wide with concern as she took in my disheveled, terrified state. I was coated in dirt and scratches, clothing ripped, soaked with sweat. I tried to speak but only managed gasping wheezes. I bent over, bracing my hands on my knees, inhaling huge gulps of air. Mom rushed to get me some water, looking quite confused and afraid. As my breathing regulated, I finally choked out. A man in the, in the woods. He was burying someone. He chased me. Mom's face went white. She grabbed the phone to call 911. I collapsed on the couch, exhausted and still trembling with adrenaline. As Mom explained the situation to the operator, I kept picturing the homicidal glint in that man's eyes as he had chased me. That was a vision I could never unsee. Dad bolted through the front door just as Mom hung up with 911. He must have seen me running and thought I was in trouble. She quickly recapped what little info I'd provided. Dad's expression hardened with anger and determination. He grabbed a baseball bat and opened the front door, ready to hunt that man down. But Mom stopped him. No, just wait here for the police to handle this she urged. They argued tensely until Dad reluctantly agreed not to go back out there. At that point, I didn't have the strength to intervene. I just sat numbly, watching it unfold, grateful to be alive. It felt like an eternity until police sirens wailed down our street. Two squad cars pulled up, 
and officers rushed to our door. As mom let them in, an ambulance arrived for me. The EMTs cleaned my scrapes and insisted I get checked for any other possible injuries. I explained to them that I was fine, and I refused to leave until I knew that the man was caught and no longer a threat. The police took my statement, asking me to show them exactly where in the woods I'd seen him. Dad said he was coming too, ignoring Mom's pleas. But she finally relented, realizing she couldn't stop us. Dad and I led the police into the forest, hoping that monster was still there and that no one else had fallen victim to his madness. My heart pounded as we approached the clearing. I prayed we wouldn't find another body buried there. To my immense relief, the ground was undisturbed, but the man was gone without a trace. While police searched the area, I recounted exactly what I'd witnessed, fighting back tears. It all felt so surreal. They found strands of long blonde hair in the dirt. His victim. The one I'd seen him kicking dirt over. Just the confirmation they needed that I was telling the truth. Dad gripped my shoulder, silently comforting me as we watched the police collect samples and photograph the scene. Before long, the police told us that we couldn't be here anymore. I could tell my dad was struggling to contain his boiling anger. He wanted to personally hunt down the killer himself, the one who had nearly taken his son's life. After an extensive sweep of the woods, which turned up no other clues, we headed home as dusk fell. The police assured us there would be an ongoing investigation and they would patrol the neighborhood until the man was caught. I doubted we would ever see that madman again. Later on, I would find out that what the man was kicking dirt over was only the head of someone he had killed. That thought made me feel even more sick. In the following days, I replayed the chilling encounter in my head over and over. I gave police as detailed a description of the killer as I could manage, working with a sketch artist to recreate his visage. It was a face I knew would haunt me forever. Those eyes were devoid of humanity, his lips twisted into a snarl. My parents got me set up with a therapist to work through the trauma, but it felt like no amount of counseling could restore the feeling of safety I'd once found in those woods. I refused to step foot there again, terrified I would cross paths once more with the monster who wished me dead. Weeks later, the police updated us, and I was not happy. None of my family was happy. They told us that the victim was identified but the killer was still at large. Without him in custody, I was constantly on edge, imagining his shadowy form lurking outside or peering in my window at night. The only saving grace was that, not too long after this, my family decided to move. Now, ten years later, the case remains cold. Never knowing if that homicidal maniac was alive or dead continues to haunt me. And while my friends have fond memories of their youth, that terrifying day stained my adolescence. I'm grateful to be alive, but I'll never have closure. Not until he faces justice for his horrors committed in those once peaceful woods. To this day, I struggle with anxiety and sleepless night. Loud noises make me jumpy. I always imagine that shovel-wielding maniac bursting through the door. Sudden movement glimpsed from the corner of my eyes conjures visions of him lunging from the shadows. I steer clear of wooded areas now, no longer finding nature's serenity and beauty peaceful. Only the creature comforts of civilization give me any sense of security now. My therapist says I'm suffering from PTSD, that my nervous system is still on high alert, anticipating fresh trauma. I've come a long way in processing what happened, learning self-care tools to manage the emotional scars. But true peace evades me. Without closure or justice, I'm left endlessly braced for the day that monster re-emerges from somewhere. Not knowing haunts me most of all. The police tried to assure me that he was possibly dead now, or at the very least long gone, as no similar crimes occurred in the area again. 
but until I see his body or see him staring back at me from behind bars, the uncertainty will linger. Somewhere out there under the sun, my would-be killer still draws breath, and the woods where he nearly took my life remain imbued with horror in my memory. Perhaps one day I'll find closure. But for now, the shadow of that traumatic day looms over me, dimming the light of every dawn. Marshes, forests, wetlands. The Florida Everglades are a beautiful place. But be careful. As you traverse the muddy soil, you may begin to hear the sound of an extra, especially heavy set of steps coming from somewhere nearby. Welcome to Camping Horrors, the show where real people send me their scariest camping and hiking stories, and I narrate them. Today's episode features a chilling encounter in the Everglades, an alleged Wendigo sighting, and the disturbing reason one listener will never stay at a certain lodge again. I would love to hear your unsettling camping and hiking stories on the show, so send them to me at darkstories.org. Thank you. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. Panthers, Boas, and the Unknown From Jason R. After retiring, I realized I'd have to find something to do to occupy my time. My wife and I have taken up traveling. She likes to go hiking and camping, which to me as a former soldier is about as much fun as a colonoscopy. But if you're married, you know that if the wife likes hiking, then you're going to be spending a lot of time slathered in bug spray and praying for the sweet release of death. While I await the grave's siren call, I try to make the best of a sweaty and exhausting situation. So I use our trips to go in search of cryptids. I've spent my life researching legends, of which Florida has more than a few. This gave me a reason to be a little bit more positive about our trip. One of the misses, Grandpops, spent a week in the Everglades, back in the day. It's a big place. Over 2,300 acres worth of swamps, grasslands, and marshes. After he passed away, my wife wanted to do a day-by-day -day recreation of his trip. Now, the Cherokee talk of the Wampus Cat. A supposed six-legged, green-eyed cat with magical powers. What kind of powers, you might ask? Well, it's said to be able to travel faster than the speed of light, hypnotize those foolish enough to get too close, and you kind of get the idea. I know a lot about the undiscovered creatures out there, and if you ask me, finding a mutant panther has to have the lowest chances of success imaginable, but probably not as bad as the odds of finding those hairy Wisconsin elves I've heard about. There are legitimate reports dating back to the 1920s and 30s that mention the beasts killing cattle in North Carolina and on down to Georgia. As one might expect, these reports were scoffed at and attributed to coyotes or other normal predators. For some reason, the legend of the Wampus Cat seems to revolve around lady folk. It's been described as a hybrid between a demonic feline and a woman. In another version of the creature's origin, a woman's husband was driven insane by Yuwa, the spirit of madness. So seeking revenge, she donned her booger mask, and using the fierce spirit of the mountain cat, she defeated the demon and became the protector of her tribe, defender of their lands. This brings me to my hunt for this elusive cryptid at the Everglades National Park. I wanted to make our own version of those Travel Channel Expedition X shows. So the wife and I went walking out in the middle of the night out there, a bit after 8 p.m., I'd say, in search of the Wampus Kitty. The monster goes by other names, such as Golly Wampus and Whistling Wampus. My wife found the concept of a whistling cat amusing, so we looked up various big cat roars and calls online. Some are what you'd expect, Others are pretty creepy. We found a good one on YouTube and proceeded on our quest. Outside of a couple of spiders and a ton of frogs, and one very hawked-off egret, 
we didn't find anything. Well, at first. At one point, we decided to be silly, using the audio to document our quest to find the elusive Wampus Kitty. We stumbled around, playing the audio of cougars in heat, pretending like we were being hunted. But that night, the only thing hunting us down to drink our blood were the mosquitoes. I want to preface the next part of my story with a little background about the Everglades. You might have heard that the Everglades have a real problem with invasive species. Some are fairly mundane, such as the walking catfish. Others, however, are monsters in their own right. You see, the Everglades have been overrun by snakes. I'm not talking about copperheads or rat snakes, I'm talking about Burmese pythons. For you non-locals, you might be thinking, ah, no big deal. But you're wrong. The largest Burmese python caught in Florida measured 19 feet. Officials said it set a new world record in length. That's a pretty big deal. Most anyone who slogs through the muck can see all kinds of smaller critters, but they rarely see these elusive snakes. So why am I telling you all this? Simply put, there are tens of thousands of pythons in Florida, and unless you hunt them down, you'll never know they're there. Thousands of lethal predators were watching our every step. The point is, large things call the Everglades home. We didn't see any sign of the wampus cat that night. It was muggy, and being tired, we headed back to the hotel to get a much-needed shower and some sleep. The next day, we visited some more of the spots that the wifey's grandfather had visited. We broke for a late lunch that I soon thought I'd be regretting for the rest of my life, but I wasn't about to let my questionable choices in cuisine stop my hunt for Garfield's disgruntled niece. We went back out, this time much farther off the beaten path. We didn't find the wampus cat this time, but we did apparently find something else, something a little more well-known. Like I said, most people have never heard of the wampus cat, but people have heard of Bigfoot and his southern cousin, the skunk ape. It's this mysterious creature that we think we happened upon. As we wandered through the pine trees and through the muck, we occasionally caught a whiff of stank. Florida does have a healthy skunk population, and my stomach hadn't been performing as advertised, so we wrote it off as being something other than the legendary Esti Kapkaki that is spoken of in Mikosuke legends. When we went out on the trail, the way was unrestricted, and to be honest, kind of boring. We'd seen a statue of the mysterious skunk ape on the way in. They've got a skunk ape headquarters and everything, too. I snapped a shot of all stinker as we drove by, but didn't think too much about it until later. The skunk ape differs from his western relatives. Allegedly, he's a bit smaller, and according to the lead researcher who scoured the swamps in search of him, there are fewer than ten of his kind left in the world. How he managed to determine the population numbers to such a precise level is beyond me. So, different night, same routine. It never occurred to us that something other than a Florida panther, which is extremely rare, might respond to the calls coming from our phones. Until something did. Have you ever entered into a dark room and felt something move in front of you? You can tell something is there because you feel the space left in its wake, or the space it's presently occupying. Now, see, in a room with its linoleum or carpet, you expect it to be quiet. But in the middle of a swamp, that's different. We knew something was there, something moving around silently. Every so often, we caught the slight mushing sound of a foot entering the mud, or the slosh of it coming back out again. But the worst sound of all was the grunt of something exerting itself, or chuffing in frustration. This was worse because that frustration seemed to be directed towards us. My wife is a professional biologist, and I'm an amateur idiot. This wasn't a panther, not a black bear, not a coyote. We thought that if we made enough noise, whatever it was would be spooked off. Naturally, 
we decided to joke about the sound coming from the most likely cryptid culprit, the skunk ape. Great, I said aloud. I can see it now. Florida man boinked to death by 400 pound swamp monkey. Why is it always Florida man? I was asking the swampy gods of doom. Naturally, they remained mum on the matter. Sadly, the same couldn't be said of my better half. It's not always Florida man, sometimes it's Florida woman. You remember that lady who got arrested for hitting a guy with a burrito? My wife replied. Oh, God, don't mention burritos. Not now, too soon. I nearly threw up. I should say here that there is a consistency to these stories of everything falling silent and people spotting glowing eyes. Now, for my encounters, it's been very different. In this particular case, the only things that matched those other stories were having things thrown at us, the smell, and the blind terror. There's not much in the way of boulders in the Everglades, but there are logs. We had to jump over quite a few of them during our hikes. On this night, there was a medium-sized one that gave us particular difficulty. Not finding anything worth filming, we circled back the way we'd came. About five minutes after we'd turned back, I fell into a hole. A hole that wasn't there before. There had been a rotting log there before, but it was gone now, and the space it had occupied was filled with mud. It'd been pulled out of the ground. More than a bit unnerved, we decided to get the heck out of there as fast as possible. Then it hit us. That smell. It smelled like what most people described. Kind of like rotting plant matter and post-septic tank cleaning body odor. The thing is, it waxed and waned depending on where we were. Whatever was out there, it was moving around. We never got the feeling it was stalking us, though. It was more like we were just random people who had crossed paths occasionally as we walked through a mall. But at some point, it must have thought we were shoplifting, because it tried to introduce what we think was a part of that log I mentioned to my wife's head. It was time to go. She wanted to run, but I threw my hand across her chest to stop her. I knew that if we ran there was a very good chance we'd be attacked by whatever was out there. Just back up and head down that side trail. We were just down there. I know, but if we slip down alongside that creek, we can get back onto the main path. Now at the moment, I was assuming what we were encountering were some kids or drunks out there. So I said, it's a ways more, but it should allow us to get past them so long as they don't circle back around. We managed to make it down to the creek, but whatever was out there with us was not letting us off that easy. As I look back on it, I think the folks who've had to contend with Sasquatch and Yetis might have had it a bit easier. A rock, at least, is a single solid object. Even if we could have seen them, the rotting chunks of wood and stinking mud it tossed at us would have been all but impossible to dodge. Still thinking we were dealing with pranksters, we moved as calmly as we could back to the main gate. We'd almost made it all the way out when I got that sense again, that feeling like there was space up ahead that was filled by some living thing. There was no noise. We just knew something was there. We were certain of it. When we made it back onto the paved portion of the trail, the silent thing chuffed and we heard it turn. We didn't hear it walk off though, it was smarter than that and much quieter. Still thinking the night's events were the work of some inebriated jerk, I ventured back into the murk the next day. I went right back to where we'd had that log chunk tossed at us and found the log shattered to bits around the tree it struck. It was bright out, so just a few clouds in the sky. I had left the wife back at the hotel. Given the events of the prior night, she was more than happy to watch some TV while her husband fumbled around out in the mud. I looked all around for footprints, something to validate our suspicions. After about half an hour, I found what I was looking for. 
footprints, or at least what had been a footprint. They appeared to have been smeared to appear less noticeable. I followed in the general direction that the footprints seemed to be heading in. Thinking back on it, I realize now that chasing after this thing's tracks was not the brightest idea I've ever had. It did pay off, though. You see, it missed covering up a couple of tracks, and what lay there in the mud made my hair stand on end. A clear footprint. It was massive. Then there was another. After that, the land turned to water, and I lost the next tracks. This wasn't the work of some bored local. But whatever did come after us that night was intelligent. It took us several hours to get back home. We kept going over what had happened. What really nagged at me was the sheer scale of the Everglades. What if there was something else lurking out there? Eventually, we got home and I made my silly video. While we've shared it with a few folks, we didn't tell them what happened to us while we were making it. But like I said, I'm hunting cryptids as a hobby now, and I thought the people around here might enjoy hearing about some of the lesser known monsters that have yet to be discovered. We will never go camping there again. From Looking for Schwaggy. Every year our family gets together for a family camp. As we got older, we became accustomed to sleeping in a bed rather than a tent. We found this beautiful lodge deep in the BC Northern Mountains and we would have the entire place to ourselves. Shortly after we arrived, I started noticing some odd occurrences, but summed it up to me being Bigfoot aware. I've had encounters in the past with what I believe to be those creatures, but I'll save that for another day. When my teenage son went out on the kayak, he came back telling me there was something moving around by the island. It sounded like he had startled something rather large. I asked if it could have been a deer, and he said no, it sounded nothing like a deer. He's an avid hunter, so I trusted his judgment. The first day carried on without much incident. Day two, my mom and husband take the boat and go fishing. They came back empty-handed, which is a rare occurrence for my husband. My dad has even joked that my husband could catch a fish if he dropped a line in a toilet. I asked about the fishing. They said they'd caught some, but when they gutted them, the insides were all rotten and full of worms somehow. Very strange for a mountain lake, but okay. We just wouldn't eat any fish on this trip. I mentioned to my husband that that was quite odd in my opinion, and we'd also not seen any birds or other typical animals. He did say he noticed, but didn't tell me, because I have a very active imagination of things that go bump in the night. Day 3 We decided to go for a walk up the road, mostly because all the kids were getting a bit wild. Walking along the road, there was a commotion up ahead. Quick, come see this, my husband called to me. There in the ditch was a huge single footprint. The road was dug into the mountain and was much lower than the forest beside it. I'm 5'11", and it was a bit taller than me. There was what looked to be a flattened part at the top, so my husband tried to climb up, but it was too soft. Whatever made that print got up there with one leap. The kids who we brought along with us were getting restless, so being a parent, I made the call to just leave the print behind. That night, the woods had a presence to them. It was like we were being watched. I didn't tell anyone since my sister was already on edge about bears and the sort. Day 4 I woke up early to try to take some cool photos of a few morning birds, if I could find any. I was excited when I spotted a few, but when they all stopped chirping at once, my heart seemed to stop and my ears opened up. I knew that meant something large was out there lurking about. This went on for some time. I could hear my husband moving about in the cabin. I began to listen, and I swear I heard something walking behind our cabin in the gravel. 
At first, I thought it was my husband. That maybe there was a back door to the cabin I didn't see, and he was coming up to try to scare me. A trick he often enjoyed at my expense. But just then, my husband opened the cabin door up. Hey, are you just getting up? I asked. Well, yeah, he replies, a bit offended I'd be asking such things on holiday. I told him in a very hushed whisper that I'd just heard something walking around behind the cabin. So, like the geniuses we were, we went out together to go look. But we didn't find anything. We started poking around in the outskirts of the tree line. We each went separate ways, trying to find something. I went left, and he went right. Before long, I started to get an uneasy feeling, that sensation of being watched. So I turned to head back to the safety of my husband. As I turned, I could see him, and I could see behind him this huge tree limb bouncing up and down, like something was holding the limb down and watching and just letting it go. Now at the time it was not windy out at all, and only that one limb was moving. We met up and I told him what I saw, and we both thought it was pretty creepy. I said we should just head back in and make some coffee, and he agreed. As the day went on, at one point we were sitting on the deck of the main lodge, catching up, as families do. Across the lake I saw this small white rectangle. I watched it for a while. Suddenly it became a huge white rectangle. It was like a large flash of a camera, but in slow motion. It lasted about three seconds. I mumbled out, what in the world is that? My family asked what I was talking about, and I described it. They shrugged it off because I was just seeing things, and we carried on with our day. That night we had a huge bonfire by the lake, and I couldn't really shake the feeling that we were being watched closely. With the darkness surrounding us on the moonless night, it was impossible to see anything that lay outside the glow of the campfire. Day 5 We sat on the deck again, when my sisters started to remark about some odd occurrences they've noted. Now, they're not Bigfoot believers, so I was especially intrigued to hear their stories. One sister stated that she kept seeing black shadow people outside her cabin window at night. Whenever she looked, they seemed to go back into the darkness. My mom got a little excited at this and exclaimed, I've seen those outside too. My husband then described this giant spider web that seemed to float through the air with little strands all around it. I tried to debunk it by saying it was probably a spider baby bomb. He's very persistent that no, he knows what that looks like, so it wasn't that. However, he couldn't quite explain what he saw exactly, but just that it looked like a floating mass that he could see through, and it had a defined outline. He was very serious, and I believed him. We all then discussed the weird feeling we were getting in the lodge, feeling watched, feeling like we had sea legs and we were queasy, at first, I thought maybe the people couldn't build a sturdy lodge, so maybe it was wobbling and we couldn't tell, causing us to get subtle motion sickness. But before long, we started to get the sensation outside, too. My brother, who remained silent for most of the time, eventually remarked, So you felt that, too? I just thought I was really high. We decided to change the subject and just enjoy our last night and our last day at the cabin. Day 6. I woke up early, because the bed was really not too comfortable, and I didn't want to waste any of the last day. I went outside the cabin, that feeling of being watched ever palpable. I sat on a stump and could hear knocks in the woods. There was a knock to my left, and one a bit farther to the right. Whatever was causing it, it was coming from two different things, and they seemed to be communicating. I then decided to go to the main washroom when I heard something inside the back room. I nearly soiled myself as the groundskeeper popped his head out and said good morning. 
I told him he nearly scared me to death, and we exchanged some pleasantries. I wasn't going to ask him about these strange happenings there, as I know how it sounds to other people. The day goes on without much happening aside from the dreaded feeling of being watched. Later on, we were all tidying up and packing up for the long drive home the next day. Me and my husband wanted to enjoy the day without packing, so we pushed it off until the evening. At the time, the kids were in the main lodge, hanging out with their cousins, playing some card games. So me and my husband finally went over to tidy up our cabin. We were loading the car up and this horrible smell just comes out of nowhere. I walk over to my husband who's half in the SUV loading things. I told him, Really? Did you need to crap your pants inside the car? He chuckled and said he didn't do it. The smell was so strong and terrible. I asked, Are you sure about that? He looked me dead in the eye and said he didn't and that he smelled nothing. I've been known to be able to smell a cow patty from two kilometers away but still I was baffled that he couldn't smell this. As he sniffed the air, I was describing the smell to him. He said that doesn't really sound like his smell. Now married people can attest to knowing their spouse's odor. It's sad but true. Luckily, he finally gets wind of the smell too, and I see his eyes go huge. The air gets thick then, and we knew we weren't alone. I heard a branch snap from the left, a tree knock that was so close I could feel it in my bones. Thud, thud. We looked at each other, both knowing. We understood we had to get back to the main lodge. We quickly power walked to the others. We let mom know, but we didn't alert the kids. She told us to go let her sister know because she was alone in her cabin with her kids. We all ended up sleeping in the lodge that night. There was this unsettling feeling in the air of being watched, and we didn't dare step out of the lodge until morning. I mentioned this strangeness to the owner in an email after we left, and he confessed that there have been many people who stayed there and either left early or stated that there was something in the woods that watched them. After all that, we opted for a less secluded camping spot the next year. Wendigo Encounter From Anonymous A few years back, I had an encounter that I could never forget. It was supposed to be a fun trip, but it turned into something darker. In late June, I decided to take a camping trip with my friend named Ava. She and I traveled about three hours from our hometown to a clearing in the midst of a thick forest. When we arrived, we immediately started to set up the tent and unpack our belongings. By the time we were done, it was already 6 p.m., and the sun was starting to set. Ava and I ended up setting up a fire and some chairs and started to cook ourselves dinner. We roasted hot dogs over the fire and after that, marshmallows, of course. We talked for a few hours, then decided we were both really tired, so we called it night. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was awakened by a loud noise. It sounded like pots and pans clinging together and falling to the ground. Apparently, this didn't wake up Ava, which didn't surprise me. She always slept like a rock. At first, I assumed it was just a deer or some other animal exploring our campsite. I made my way to the door of the tent to unzip it, and I checked what had made all the racket, but I was stopped by an unearthly sound. The only way I can describe it is a car slamming on its brakes so hard that there's a screech. I jumped back from the tent opening, startled out of my mind. I was completely terrified, because I had absolutely no idea what this thing outside of my tent was or what it wanted but I had to find out what it could have been. Once again, I stepped towards the tent's door and I began to unzip it. I tried to make as little noise as possible as I opened up that door. As I looked out, I saw nothing at first. 
until I looked over to the chairs. I saw something there that shook me to my very core. There was a figure there, a creature standing on two legs with incredibly long and thin limbs. It was covered in what looked to be a solid black coat of fur. Its head reminded me of a deer at first, but there was something off about it, something that I couldn't pinpoint. Then the creature let out another scream, much louder this time, forcing me back. I covered one ear with my hand, using the other to zip the tent back up. I crawled back next to Ava, who I saw was now awake, confused, and as terrified as I was. When the wail died down, before Ava could ask what was going on, that creature wailed again. We listened to it wail and walk around, before finally we could no longer hear it. By then, it was nearly dawn. When we felt we were safe, we packed up everything as quickly as possible, and we left, not looking back. Neither me nor Ava have been camping since, and I'm not planning on going back anytime soon. Thank you for stopping by at our little campsite here at Camping Horrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us for narration at darkstories.org. For more narrations from me, you can catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or you can go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails. And be sure to leave Camping Horrors a rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Now then, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.